There we go. Starting that. All right, everybody, I'm going to start this poll. This is to see how many of you have actually seen a galaxy before. And yes, the Milky Way counts. So it's the easiest one of our galaxies to spot because it takes up so much of the sky because we are in it. But of course, we will get to that. Um, and so click on the most advanced of those that apply to you. So if you've seen one of the other ones, you can click on that. If you've seen just the Milky Way and none of the others, click on that one. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna vote for... Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> You're not allowed to vote. <laughs> no, it doesn't count me. I'm it doesn't count say... you. That's okay, you can verbally vote. What, what have you seen? Uh, almost all of the above. I should have included an all the above. That didn't occur to me. <laughs> okay. We have some pretty go. good observers here. We've got about a third. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll let you all vote a little bit longer before I reveal the answers. Yes, let's see what people <laughs> give us. So we're doing, we're doing pretty well in terms of observers here. All right, I'm gonna give you guys five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, done. Um, alrighty, so the majority of people have seen something other than Milky Way and Andromeda. So I'm really impressed because I believe other than those two, at least up here in the Northern hemisphere, you need some sort of assisted viewing device to view any other this, than Andromeda and the Milky Way, right? Something like binoculars or a telescope. Well, we're gonna, part of our, part of our time today is going to give people some guide as to how to how to see the some more of them for themselves so we'll perfect we'll okay well i will stop revealing our secrets <laughs> no, no, <you're> not <laughs> <laughs> and i will just uh i'll just we're at 332 so we'll get started um i did want to mention a couple of things first of all very exciting news um we have a meteor shower coming tonight tomorrow night tomorrow night tomorrow night's the peak um we're going to talk a little bit about that here uh, before we get started, the big news that I wanted to give you is that we're changing our format a little bit here. Um, we already changed our name, so we figured why not change all the other things too. It's all <laughs> work, in pro work in progress. Exactly. We're sort of, uh, Chris and I have been doing this now for what, about a month or so, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And we're finding that it ends up taking up quite a bit of time. And so what we're going to do, and also that we are not able to answer all your questions because we only have 60 minutes per session. So what we're going to do as a compromise is we're going to host one session a week, but it's gonna be 90 minutes long. Um, and so in that 90 minutes, we're gonna do a little bit of space news, at the beginning, cover our topic in the middle for the most, like the meat of the session. And then at the end, we'll take more questions so that we can properly answer all the questions that come up. And so that we have an, a day off where we can calm ourselves down and react appropriately to the levels of- Yes, and, and a big virtual round of applause for Jenna, who's hosting <laughs> all of the various uh, treats that we're delivering to your to your computers every week so she's working really hard behind the scenes everybody so i think you should know that thank you for saying that chris none of this could happen without you and people like you to help me through all this stuff i am just the vamping question asker <laughs> wow um, you're a, already. You're a key component all right so i we're going to do something um a little different in this session in that I'm going to start off using not Stellarium, but a different software package called Starry Night. And this is actually the, um, the planetarium version of Starry Night that I use with my mobile planetarium, just because there's a couple of things in here that I can show you nicely that um, I can't do in Stellarium. So there's still, there's still, we'll switch over to Stellarium partway through to help me guide you to see some galaxies for yourself on the next clear night. But for now, I just wanna give you some background on galaxies by starting with Starry Night. And so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Here we go. So everybody should see something similar. It's a whole sky view here. And I want to point you for some additional information. Um, a couple of years ago, I published an article on space.com called Touring the Galactic Zoo. And if you can see the URL for it, it's up here. But if you just Google um, site space.com galactic zoo or my name, you'll, you'll come across the article. And I'm gonna just run through uh, the con some of the contents of this information. But what's cool in this article is that near the bottom of the article, it's got uh, actually a table of an index of 
lots of pretty easy, you know, relatively easy to see galaxies of the different types that we're going to talk about during the uh, next few minutes. So you can make, make note of that URL and look I've, that one up yourself. I'm going to, I'm going to send it out right now. I'm Googling sure. in the background. There you go. Right. Now, let me just grab a couple more pictures here from my little gallery. Here we go. So our Milky Way is the galaxy we live in. When you go out on a clear night, virtually everything that you see in the sky that isn't, you know, that wasn't made by humans orbiting like satellites and Starlink satellites are things that are part of our Milky Way. So they're either part of our own solar system or they're the stars beyond our solar system. But all the stars you see with your, with your unaided eyes are all components of our whole Milky Way galaxy. And I'm just gonna bring up a picture here that kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about. This is from an app called Our Galaxy, which is a relatively newly released app. And uh, it's kind of a neat um, app that renders our galaxy in three dimensions and lets you plot various um, components, deep sky objects and things like that. And we can, we're actually gonna talk about Messier objects and deep sky objects in a future session. But you can see that our galaxy sort of resembles this um, flat disk with a central bulge or a central concentration of stars. Let me just bring up another another view of that. And so while, while you're bringing that up, one of the things that uh, I think ends up miscommunicated in science a lot is that these are either pictures or that we um, know this because we've seen it. Um, and I wanted to clarify that the reason we know what the Milky Way looks like, or we we have an idea of what the Milky Way looks like at the moment, um, is because we've looked at other galaxies that are similar, and we've taken the information that we have just from looking kind of anyway, looking kind of through it. Um, so our, our idea of what our galaxy actually looks like changes a lot over time. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, that galaxy behind my head is. Let me just get the number here for you. Ever appropriate. Of course you have a galaxy up in your background. You're good at this it's, stuff. It's NGC 6744 and it's only visible in the southern hemisphere, but it's it's a galaxy that astronomers think might most likely rep, um, appear like our Milky Way from a distance. So when you get to that article, when you go look at the article, you can get a nice picture of it, but um, I'll come back to that in a second. So what I want to do here is I'm going to start on the ground at David Dunlap Observatory, and I'm just going to fly us into space. And what I want to do is I want to put a pin on the sun. So I put a label on the sun. And as I just increase my distance from Earth and from pretty soon you'll see the planets and the sun start shrinking down to one spot. And you can see at the top of the screen here, I've got a distance from Earth indicator here. So we're 4,670 astronomical units from the Earth. That's um, 4,760 times farther from the sun than the Earth is on average. Now we're at a fifth of a light year. And I'm just gonna keep going. And here we go. And I can start, we're now flying out of our Milky Way. And I'm just gonna bring this up into view here. So we're about 3,000 light years, 3,200 light years from Earth. Let's keep going from where this is going. So I'm, just, I'm gonna just click on the center of this and do this. So what I can do is I've got a, the our whole Milky Way galaxy shown as a three-dimensional object. So I can actually roll this around. So there you can see that our galaxy is a big broad disk. We think it's about 100,000 light years in diameter. The estimates are constantly changing. So if your number, the number you've learned doesn't match the number I'm saying, it's because papers are coming out all the time and they're saying it's bigger, it's smaller. <laughs> We're not quite <laughs> sure, but it's roughly about 100,000 light years in diameter. And it's somewhere around two or three or 4,000 light years thick. So the proportions would be similar to say a DVD or a CD sort of a 20 to one or 50 to one 
uh, ratio. And when we look at galaxies in the sky, some of the galaxies we're looking at are oriented sort of face on to us. So when, that, when we look at them that way, they're, they cover a lot of sky and all the light from all of their stars is distributed on this sort of patch of sky. It might be a circular patch or, or an oval sort of patch, depending on the orientation of the galaxy. And what you could understand is that every individual galaxy in the universe can be oriented at any random angle. So some could be um, upright, upside down, sideways, and so on. So if we were able to fly away and look at our Milky Way from afar, look down on it, we would see this sort of center concentration of stars and some spiral arms that wrap around. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grab this other picture here, and bring this in, because it's a nicer picture than the one that the software is showing. So this gives you an idea of, of what it looks like. So our, our, we used to think that our galaxy was kind of um, a pure spiral, but now we think it's what we call a barred spiral, it has a, a stubby bar rather than a circular core. So it has an elongated core, short, sort of a short stubby bar. And these spiral arms wrap around it. The whole galaxy rotates about once every quarter of a billion years. So there's sort of this cyclical nature. And as the sun gets carried around, as the galaxy rotates, the mutual gravity from the various stars sort of jostle the stars and they move around a little bit from place to place, but keeping this general form. And the pink areas that you see in these arms, they represent uh, clouds of hydrogen gas that are being, in many cases, um, in the process of birthing new stars. So they're glowing by the radiation of the stars that are forming within them and causing these bright sort of knots of pink gas to glow. And when you look at photographs of other galaxies, like the one behind my head, you can see there's lots of the pink knots in the spiral arms of that galaxy. And we also have in those arms, we have dark patches, and these are opaque dust that's concentrated in the plane of our galaxy. And then we've got the, you know, the stars and so on in between. And you can see on this map that we have actually given names to these various arms. So our sun is located here. So our sun is about 25 or 30,000 light years distant from the core of our galaxy. So that means that we can look back towards it the middle, or we can look 180 degrees and look at the outer rim of our galaxy. And when we do that, and the expression of our galaxy across the sky is what we see as the Milky Way. So I'll come back to, to that in a minute. But you can see that we've actually given names to these arms. And then the arm names generally come from the constellation that sort of dominates that direction of the sky. So if you look in the direction of Orion, you're seeing kind of the stars that are in that Orion arm. Perseus is here. Uh, there's a constellation called Norma. There's another one called Scutum and Centaurus. And so that's how we sort of name the neighborhoods as opposed to Star Trek, which is like Alpha Quadrant, Beta Quadrant. Things <laughs> like that. So we're talking the astronomer's terms here. There is just a quick question from Emma McPhee, which was more or less answered by you. So I just want to make sure that we, we make it clear, which was during winter, we see one arm of the Milky Way in the summer. Are we looking at a different arm or the same one sort of like following a curve around? Um, it's actually, it actually would be different arms because uh, Orion is a winter constellation. So in the winter time, we're basically seeing this part of the sky. And in the summer, when we're, the sun is in the way of Orion and those winter constellations, we're looking more predominantly at night in the other direction. And so we're seeing more of the Sagittarius part of the sky. So that, that's true. We're seeing the different arms at different times of the year. Thank you. I'm gonna come back to that in a second, actually. Okay. So. So as I said, when we look at a galaxy in the sky, sometimes we're seeing them kind of face on to us. And when a galaxy is, is oriented face on to us, even though we're seeing all the, all the combined light of its stars, the, the light is actually distributed over a patch of the sky. And it, we kind of have an average brightness, but there's no sort of bright concentrated part of the light. But when we're looking at a galaxy that's oriented edge on, I'm just going to get in our virtual starship and fly us mm -hmm. edge on to our Milky Way. So if a galaxy is oriented edge on to us, then it looks like a fairly bright streak across the sky, a little sort of a stubby, a stubby streak with maybe um, tapered ends to it. And those would be what we call an edge on galaxy. 
So this would be the situation where you can have a face on, a face onto a spiral galaxy or an edge onto a spiral galaxy. Now, when a galaxy is edge onto us, all the light that we're seeing from the galaxy is now concentrated in a much smaller area of the sky. And what we call this is great is um, larger or greater surface brightness. So the average, um, the average brightness of that galaxy is easier to see in your telescope because the light is all concentrated into a much smaller patch of the sky. So these are the ones that I'm gonna show you some of these to pursue on the next clear night. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take us back home and I'm gonna set the sky to January 1st at about 11 o'clock at night. I'm picking 11 o'clock because it's dark in the winter at 11 o'clock and it's also dark in the spring at 11 o'clock. So here I've got the nighttime sky over Toronto and it really doesn't matter. It's basically the same idea for the local 11 o'clock local time anywhere in Canada across, across coast to coast. And so if you look sort of in the Southern sky in the winter time, you can might recognize that I've got the constellation of Orion here right over the southern horizon. I'm just going to add the constellation lines on here. So this is actually what we call the wintertime constellation, the winter, const the winter um, uh, Milky Way. And the winter Milky Way essentially comes up through Canis Major, which is the bright star Sirius. And it runs right past Orion's club, tickles the toes of Gemini, runs through Auriga, and then heads through past Perseus, and then descends into the Northwest through Cassiopeia, Lacerda, Cygnus, and so on. And you might notice that in this, in this um, representation that the galaxy gets dim right around in here. And that's a combination of two factors. One is that there's more of that opaque dust in the sky that's blocking the light of the stars, but it's also because we're looking at the outer rim of the galaxy, so opposite the core. And so we're seeing sort of the thinner edge of the galaxy when we look that way. Now, I wanted to point out that if the galaxy wasn't obscured by the dark dust, we'd see it more like this. I don't know if you can really tell. So now you can get an idea that the stars are sort of thinning out near Auriga where the, uh, the galaxy's outer, outer edge is. Mm -hmm. And even though you look up at the night sky and it looks like it's nice and clear and dark, you know, when the moon's not in the picture, and you might see the Milky Way shining up. The, the fact that we live inside the Milky Way has an impact on the space around us in three dimensions. And there's actually a lot of intervening material that we're looking out at when we're looking at the constellations and stars in the sky. And this is a map in the infrared of the gas and dust that are distributed through our Milky Way, through the plane of the Milky Way. So the, the plane of the galaxies here but all of this red represents faint dust and gas that's, that's sort of distributed across the thickness of that disk. So when we're inside the disk, we've still got stars above us and below us, as well as in the plane of the Milky Way all around us. And what that means is that all of this material is actually slightly hindering us from seeing into the deep universe beyond our galaxy. So if we wanna see other galaxies, we need to look at parts of the sky where there isn't as much of this material in our way. And that would give us our best view of the sky. And here's what's cool. So if we start on January 1st and I advance the date, and I'm just gonna put the date forward at 11 o'clock and watch what the Milky Way is doing as I jump from night to night. You can see it's actually migrating towards the west. And this is due to the Earth rotating around the sun and different constellations coming into view and, and with them goes the Milky Way. And so by the time we get into April, so here I'm in mid-March, and something interesting really happens here. So when we get into April, stop around the middle of the month, you might notice that the Milky Way is now hugging the horizon here. So the Milky Way is, is because of the orientation of the Earth's axis and our relationship with the, sol with the sun and the solar system, it actually causes the Milky Way to clear out of the way of the night sky in springtime in, north, in the Northern Hemisphere every year. So in April and May, we're now able to look into this sort of zenith part of the sky and not have nearly as much of that interfering mm -hmm. material. 
And that actually opens up a virtual or a literal window of opportunity to see galaxies. Hmm. So let's just run ahead to tonight. And that's why uh, we've been using the term galaxy season. Yeah, so astronomers love this time of year and, and we wanna get out and away from the city lights because this is the time where we can start hunting down galaxies. Now, I wanna point out that if I actually can put a grid on here. So this grid is actually the galactic coordinate system. And so the galactic equator would be drawn around the edge here and the North Galactic Pole would be right in the center of the circle. So we're essentially looking vertically up out of the plane of our Milky Way, straight sort of galactic north, if you like. So this should be, should be the least amount of material in the way of seeing the galaxies other than our Milky Way. And that happens to sit near this constellation that looks like a, a 90 degree angle, and that's Coma Berenices. So let me just zoom in on Coma Berenices a bit here. some star labels on here. Okay, so you can see this Coma Berenice. This is not a very prominent constellation, but it's something that you can certainly see um, from suburban skies and certainly if you can get away from the city lights. And we'll come back to that in a bit, a bit more in a minute. The other one, the other constellations that are, that are our friends here are Leo the Lion and Virgo the Maiden. And Leo is, is composed of brighter stars, so it's pretty easy to recognize if you head outside on the next clear night, you wanna look into the southern or southeastern evening sky and look for the distinctive constellation of Leo. It's got a kind of a backwards question mark of stars that form the lion's head. And then there's a set of stars kind of forming a triangle that forms his hindquarters and his tail. And what you wanna look for is this star at the tip of his tail, that star's name is De nebula. And if you keep going sort of extrapolating past the end of De nebula, there's a star down here called Vindemiatrix. Hmm. So we'll come back. I'm going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. And we're going to go into Stellarium and look into that. Okay. So just, can I can I briefly give a star hopping trick to get to Leo? Sure. I don't know if I remember it totally right. If you go from, and I can't remember the names of these two stars, not Den uh, not um, Merak and Dupe in the Big Dipper, but the other two on the pot, um, two. those two, and yep. they point down towards one of the stars in Leo. I can't remember which one is the one by his yeah. neck. Probably El Giaba or one of those, yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's how you can yeah. find the question mark. Um, so I had just, a question, uh, someone asked to speak a little bit louder as well. I'm not sure which one of us you're referring to. <laughs> We will do our best. I'll try to do that. If I have to clip on my mic, I'll, I'll do that as well. All right, so just to orient everybody, so here's the southern sky. This is around, let's go back an hour or so. Here's 11 p.m. And you can look sort of south at 11 p.m. or maybe even a little earlier than that. The sky gets dark, certainly by 10 o'clock. So Leo should be about a little more than halfway up, say two thirds of the way up the southern sky at about 10 p.m. So let me just, Get rid of this for a minute. I'm going to switch back to Stellarium. So I want to talk a little bit about how galaxies are classified. So back in the 20s, uh, Edwin Hubble of the famous Hubble Space Telescope, he was working at the Palomar Observatory in California. Let's pause this up. And he was, uh, he was actually looking at a special type of star called Cepheid variable star. And Cepheid variable stars have this unique property that they vary in brightness over a time scale, maybe, maybe several days. And the, um, the star's brightness is direct, directly related to their period of variability. And so if you measure, stare at a Cepheid variable star and record its brightness over a number of days or hours, you can then use a mathematical formula to calculate how bright it should be. And then if you look, compare how bright it should be with how bright it actually appears, then you could guesstimate its distance from you. And so he, 
he, he and other astronomers, including um, Helen Sawyer Hogg, who worked at the David Dunlop Observatory in Richmond Hill in Canada, was studying Cepheid variables in various places in the galaxy in order to sort of create the, the measuring stick or the yardstick for how the scale of our galaxy and then, and then beyond. And so um, Hubble in around in, 1920, uh, in the 1920s, um, he started finding Cepheid variable stars within these fuzzy patches of the sky. And in those days, astronomers didn't know that there were other galaxies other than the Milky Way. We knew of our own galaxy, but we didn't understand really what it was, how it was structured, and we didn't know for sure that there were other such things. But when he started finding these Cepheid variables in other galaxies, he started to notice and calculate their distances and realize that they were completely far away or com must be completely outside our own Milky Way galaxy. And so he started to infer that these must be other so-called island universes or other galaxies in the universe. And so what he started to do was, was classify them according to how they look. And I'm just gonna bring up a diagram that shows you the classification system of galaxies. Let me bring this up here. And you notice that some galaxies look like spirals that we view face on with nice, nice circular uh, central boulders and spiral arms wrapping around. Um, some didn't show arms at all. They just showed as sort of blobs. And so what he did is he broke these um, various galaxies into different classes or different families. He called the amorphous blob ones ellipticals. And he found some that were kind of spherical and some that were more elliptical, oval, more, more extreme. And he assigned a, a number. So he said that the E0 would be elliptical that's round and an E7 would be an elliptical that's stretched out or elongated. Then as far as the spiral galaxies go, he found ones that had sort of spherical cores. And depending on the dominant or the, the sort of ratio between how big the core is compared to the arms, he, he broke them down into different classifications. So the ones that had um, small cores and lots of arms, he called spiral type A, and then it went out to A, B, C, and D where you got um, bigger arms and smaller core until eventually you had hardly any arms at all. And then the other type that he saw that where the, the core was not a sphere, but was elongated stretched out bar, he called these a barred spiral galaxy. So instead of an SA, he called it an SB for spiral barred. And again, he used the A, B, C, D, and so on to sort of tell us how the arms compared to the size of the core. And then of course, as all things go, after you start studying things for a long time, you start finding exceptions to the rule. And so um, Hubble and other astronomers, including another named de Valcouleur, created a system where they discovered sort of spiral galaxies that were in between the two. So kind of a mix of both. And then there were some that just completely didn't fit the mold at all. They were just irregular. And they had, that the regular galaxies are in all likelihood galaxies that have had close encounters with other galaxies and have been pulled into funny shapes or, or warped by gravitational attraction by other galaxies. And so nowadays astronomers use this sort of tuning fork diagram to plug in the galaxies in their different classification. But, but this is actually just based on how they look from Earth, because of course we can't fly through space and see the galaxies, how they look. So if you see a, a galaxy edge on, as I showed in, um, in the Starry Night a few minutes ago, when it's really edge on, we can't really see that well, how the arms compared to the core and that kind of thing. So there's some uncertainty in the classification system. I also have a question about the elliptical galaxies. So let's say the difference between elliptical zero and elliptical seven. What if elliptical seven is just an elliptical zero tilted on its side? Yeah, so that that sort of, um, what's the word? Inconsistency or, or yeah. uncertainty is not accounted for in the just the visual observing. Okay. So that's possible. Now, since this was created, this system, astronomers now have the ability to look at the Doppler shift, the red shift mm -hmm. of pieces of the galaxy. So they could take a look at the stars on one end of it and one star is the other end of it. And they could tell, you know, if the stars, the way that the stars are moving because of the way their light is Doppler shifted, red shifted or blue shifted, whether the 
how the galaxy is moving and by you know, looking at the way that the star's velocities move throughout the, the galaxy, they can infer, oh, it must be spherical or it must be elliptic, or it must be a true disk. That, that is way. incredible. I, yeah. It's so cool what we can figure out just from looking at something. <laughs> Now, uh, the other thing I wanna make sure that people understand about this diagram is this is not to scale. So in actuality, um, the elliptical galaxies are quite often huge compared to the spiral galaxies. And one of the, the working theories is that the elliptical galaxies are actually the end product of galaxy merger. That a lot of, that, that perhaps um, a galaxy swallowed up its, its neighbor and maybe the double-sized galaxy swallowed up, pulled in another neighbor until eventually um, the mutual gravitational of all the stars and the combined galaxies have sort of just formed into some sort of amorphous uh, ellipse. And I'm going to show you some examples of some of these various galaxies as well. So this is a cool picture. So here we are. I'm going to go clockwise around this. And I'm just going to give you the give you what these different galaxies are. So the one in the upper left here, this is called Messier 87. And this is a gigantic um, elliptical galaxy. Um, it's in that spot between uh, Leo and Virgo. So we'll zoom in on that in Stellarium in here in a couple of minutes. This is the galaxy that contains the black hole that the radio astronomers put out in the, in the news last year. So what they did is they used a network of radio telescopes and interferometry techniques to dial in and zoom right in and just pick out the tiny core of this galaxy, which has a very supermassive um, active black hole in the core of it. And that was the black hole um, shadow, the ring, the orange ring that you saw in the news. It was inside this galaxy, Messier 87. And because this galaxy is so big, it's actually one of the easiest ones to find with, with amateur telescopes and during this time of the year, spring galaxy season. So M87. The next one is one of these situations where we have a galaxy edge on. And this one's actually called uh, the spindle galaxy, Messier 102. Okay, and you can see that there's um, a glow, the glow from all the stars in the galaxy. And then there's this dark line crossing it. And that's the, the dust, the opaque dust that's sort of concentrated in the plane of that galaxy. So that's Messier 102. That's considered to be a lenticular galaxy. Okay, perfect. We had a question about lenticular galaxies. Yeah, so lenticular galaxies, let's see. Uh, yeah, lenticular galaxies, they have the disks, they have a bulge, but, they, but their arms aren't defined. So, it's, so imagine that the disk is just uh, one continuous plate rather than the spiral arm. So that's what a lenticular galaxy would Interesting. Consider. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So not as much internal structure. All right. Then we've got the one here. You can see right away, we've got a nice bar and we've only got two arms. So we've got the galaxy is dominated by the core, not so much by the arms. So this galaxy is NGC 1365. So that's a barred spiral galaxy. Then down here, we've got a galaxy that's called the crowbar, but in Canada, we call this the hockey stick. Yes, Canada. Or maybe it's, the lacrosse, maybe it's more like a lacrosse stick, but it's a hockey <laughs> stick, lacrosse stick. Uh, this is NGC 4656. And this is up, this is up near that Coma Berenices, that, that sort of L-shaped constellation. We'll show you where that is in a couple of minutes here. And then finally down here, the last one in this set is Messier 81. It's also called Bode's Nebula. And this is, um, this is a basic spiral galaxy. So you can see it's a really pretty galaxy. It's, it's not face on, it's not edge on, but it's kind of a mix. So when a galaxy is kind of oval like this, we're actually seeing it oriented intermediate between edge on and face on. So that's why we get different sort of amounts of ellipticity in the galaxies that we see. Are you about to change windows? Wait, come back. Um, I, have, I have one more question. Um, which was, uh, someone was asking about the uh, telescope size that you would need to see these galaxies. So it, it more depends on your dark sky than it does on your telescope. Um, what I think a good rule of thumb is that if you've got um, 
And again, it also comes back to, is the galaxy high surface brightness? And so it's more visible than one that's spread out. Um, but basically, if you've got kind of a four inch telescope, maybe a four inch reflector or a six inch reflector or an eight inch telescope or even bigger, then you're probably pretty well set. If you've got a small department store telescope that's maybe 60 millimeter, 70 millimeter, they're really, really thin ones, um, you're gonna have trouble seeing these galaxies, but you'll have no trouble seeing the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is not really Andromeda galaxy season. Um, in a minute, I'll show you where it is right now. And, um, but you can, you can sort of put a pin in that and, and remember to look for Andromeda when it gets nicely placed in the sky again. I'm sure so, we'll yeah. talk so, about it once so, that it so comes. If you get a six topic. inch, six inch, eight inch telescope, you're you're going to be able to see some of these galaxies. Um, the other really good advice is once the social distancing is all over, um, come on out to a you know a, a Rask star party where you're bound to have astronomers there who have ten inch, twelve inch, sixteen inch, twenty inch telescopes, aperture wise, I mean, and those light buckets are really well suited to to seeing the galaxies. Now, when you look at a galaxy in a telescope, you're basically gonna see um, a dim fuzzy patch in the sky. <laughs> and you can sort of train your eye to start recognizing some of the, some of the, tech, some of the shape maybe. You know, when get, in a case like this, you might make out, barely make out that it's sort of a backwards S shape. Um, the hockey stick galaxy, you can see the little hook, you know, if your telescope uh, is big enough. Um, the other thing you don't wanna, you know, look, don't be looking for color because the um, limited aperture telescopes that amateurs use just don't gather enough photons to trigger the color receptors in your eye. So you're gonna see black and white sort of smudges of galaxies. Um, the other technique that's really useful is if you think you've got a galaxy or two in your view, just give your telescope tube a little tap and let it vibrate. And the, uh, the, 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 the eyepiece or the field of view in your telescope will kind of shake a little bit and the fuzzy patch will move. And that'll trigger your brain to be able to recognize that fuzzy patch a little right. more clearly. Yeah, so just, just be, if you think you're seeing it, but you're not quite sure, just give it a little tap a couple times and make it wiggle. And then your eye will pick it up a, little, a lot better. That's the other technique of course, is to use averted vision. Mm -hmm. So if you try to look straight onto the galaxy, you're, you're not gonna be exciting the receptors in your eye that are sensitive to dim light as, as much. So what you want to do is try to look to the left or right or above or below where you think the galaxy is and try to kind of notice it out of the corner of your eye. You, you'll, you'll actually, it takes a little practice to get used to doing it, but it's a really useful technique for seeing the dimmer objects in your telescope. Any other questions before I put this away? Uh, I think we're, uh, we'll ask one now. It could be asked later, but I'll ask it now because you have pictures up. Um, is it true that the stars around a galaxy act like the rings in, of a planet, like Saturn? Well, whenever you see rings or arms wrapped around a center of mass, you're really looking at physics in action. You're looking at gravity in, at work. So the, um, the, the shape of a galaxy is that way because the mass and the stars that have been generated have actually been moved into an equilibrium that's produced by the gravity that's pulling each, each star pulling on each other star. So um, you can even have galaxies that look like um, a core separate from a ring around it of stars. Um, I'm not sure if I can hmm. find one that quickly, but. Oh yeah. But all of these sort of disks and spirals and, and shapes all have you know physics and gravity causes for them, but. Um, I mean, it's a different, it's a different principle, but. Yeah, it does. The one thing that I was, the only thing I was thinking was how um, the, uh, the rings around a planet move in a certain direction as does like everything kind of ends up being flat in space. Um, galaxies, rings around planets, um, orbits of planets around stars. And that's all just because of the average motion of the stuff that's in that space. Um, That's so the conservation of angular momentum. If you start rotating uh, a ball of, of movable objects, um, the, the axis or see sort of the, um, the short axis will start to collapse towards the, where all the mass is collected. And so that's why eventually um, one rotation axis um, sort of dominates 
and everything else sort of collapses down to form that pancake shape. So in that way, they're um, somewhat it, similar. Yeah. Um, if you've seen those pictures of um, the asteroids Bennu and Ryugu, you notice they look like two pyramids on top of each other. And that's because those, those asteroids are, are rubber, rubble piles and they're slowly rotating. And the rubble is actually rolling downhill to collect at the equator. And so you get these sort of a big equator and a peaky, peaky north and south pole. It's all, oh, it's cool. all the way gravity pulls on, on mass. It's really uh -huh. interesting. All right, so let's, uh, we've got about 20 minutes here. I'm just gonna give you some homework. I'm gonna show you where things are and let you go out on the next clear night and hunt them down. So the reason that we're focusing on galaxies this week is that the moon is out of the sky. So the moon is gonna be pretty much out of the sky um, until beyond the weekend. So that gives us, if you get clear nights, and we're not getting many clear nights in Toronto, unfortunately, yeah. boo. But um, if you're in a place where you've got dark skies and, and uh, clear skies, the moon will not brighten the sky and ruin the contrast of the sky with the galaxy. So what you wanna do is you wanna go out and let the sky get nice and dark. And for the Toronto area, that's kind of 9.30 or later at this time of the year. So once we get to about 9.30, Head on out and sort of face south and look for, you can look for that distinctive constellation of Leo. And by the way, just to give you some scale here, this bright star is Regulus, this bright star is Denebola. I'm using that measuring tool on Stellar and that's about 25 degrees or two and a half outstretched fish. Yeah, or the surfer salute. Yeah. Yeah, so from <laughs> Regulus down to Denebola is the surfer salute. Hang loose, just, Leo. I'm just gonna actually, Give myself some more star names here. Here we go. Oops, a little bit more. Here we go. And I'm just going to get rid of the ecliptic. Okay. Yeah. So find Regulus, that's a very bright star, and then sort of work your way down and look for Denebola. And you can see Denebola makes this triangle with Zosma, and this star's name is Churton. Let me just zoom in a little bit here. Churton. Churton. And then across the way, you've got this star here. It's named, its name is Vindemiatrix. It's otherwise known as Epsilon Virginis. So it's the star Epsilon in this constellation of Virgo. And if you take your backyard telescope and you just aim it the best you can, halfway between Denebola and Vindemiatrix, this is what you're going to see. So I'm just gonna, I'm just turning on the deep sky label, deep sky layer for Stellarium. And I'm just gonna zoom in on this patch of sky. And all of these red ovals are galaxies. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my deep sky menu under view settings. And I'm just gonna crank this up and show more of them. Ooh. So this is halfway between Denebola and Vindemiatrix. Just aim your telescope in this spot and you're bound to pick up a galaxy. Do you wanna use your uh, lowest magnification eyepiece to begin with? So the eyepieces all have numbers on them and you wanna pick up the eyepiece that has the largest number on it because that'll give you the widest field of view through your telescope. Okay, now you can use binoculars if your sky is really dark. Um, most of the galaxies in this patch of the sky will be too small for binoculars, but you might pick some up. I'll give you some other ones to chase some binoculars in a couple of minutes here. Mm -hmm. And don't let me forget to go back to Andromeda before we- Okay, go. yeah, I will note that. Yeah. All right, so here we go. I'm just gonna zoom in. And the more I zoom in, the more galaxies I pick up. You can see there's thousands of them. This is the Virgo cluster of galaxies. And these galaxies are all mutually uh, attracting one another and sort of existing in the universe as a family of galaxies. There's hundreds or thousands of them in this sort of part of the sky, part of the universe. And if I just keep going in here, you can see that I've got sort of these numbers. So the numbers are the um, representation or the codes that we use to na give names to these deep sky objects. And on Thursday, we're going to talk about Messier and NGC and what some of these codes mean and give you a bit of history about how they all came to be. But if I say that I'm looking at an object called M91, that's Messier 91. 
or Messier 88. And this one down here, this is Messier 87. This is that one that had the black hole that we saw in the news. And again, just to give you an idea where it is, the nebula, the nematrix. So this is one of the ones that you're likely to see when you, when you, when you point at that part of the sky with your telescope, this big elliptical smudge in your telescope. Once you've got that, then you can start just scanning around and picking up the bigger ones. And there's actually a patch up here, and this is called Markarian's chain. And it's the chain of galaxies just by coincidence happen to look like a curved line of galaxies in the sky. Hmm. They're all at different distances. And I should have mentioned that that Messier 87 galaxy is actually 60 million light years away from the Earth. So the light we're seeing has been traveling for 60 million years to get to us. And in most cases, the smaller ones you see here are farther than that. Not all of them have distances. Let's see if I can pick up some that have distances. This one's 56 million and so on. And when you get in here, you can start seeing, here's some more elliptical ones. This is Messier 86, Messier 84. Here's one that's not a Messier, but it's almost edge on to us. This pair are called the eyes because they look like a pair of bright, bright patches that sort of at the right distance apart from each other to look like eyes. And you can see that there's, there's not a nice clean galaxy shape here. And that's because the two galaxies are, are sort of tugging on each other and they've, they've distorted the classic shape of the galaxy. This is one of these more irregular, we call these interacting galaxies. Here's one down here that's cool. So you can see it's sort of got a stubby bar, but almost a ring around the outside. So most of these don't have, you know, nicknames, but some of them do. So Markarian's chain, we've got those two. Well, the eyes, for example, have their nickname. Yeah, the eyes are a nickname. Yeah. So you can just, you can just park yourself in this patch of sky. Oh, one thing I forgot to tell you, when you do this, Point your telescope at De Nebula first and focus it as well as you can. Mm. Get, yourself, get the star to a nice pinpoint because you won't be able to easily focus on the dim fuzzy galaxies very well. I mean, when you do get into the neighborhood, if you do happen to pick up some, some stars, you can perhaps tweak your focus there, but I think it would be easier to start with your telescope already focused and then start your search. Mm -hmm. So that's a patch of sky. This is the Markarian's chain and the Virgo cluster. So, and, go ahead. Just, just a question about the colors around the galaxies. There's some red, some orange, some blue. What do, do you know what the colors mean? Um, I'm not sure what Stellarium is using for this. Um, it might be a case of they're using the different classifications for different types of galaxies. I haven't looked yeah. that up, but I can try to find that out. I'll go. Those. I'll go see if I can find it on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, in Stellarium, they use the ovals for galaxies. They use other uh, shapes for other types of objects. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you another really neat technique, and this that's to go back to our friend Coma Berenices. Now, Coma Berenices actually means Bernice's hair. Let me just bring up the picture. It's kind of her lock of hair, and if you're using binoculars, you can pick up this sort of three stars in a in a 90 degree angle and look for a patch of stars that are sitting just to the right of the uppermost one. And this kind of represents the tuft of hair at the end of the lock of hair. That's easy to see in a telescope, but you wanna to try to get your telescope onto this star named Aldefira. So let me just zoom in on Aldefira and I'm gonna open it up, zoom in a little bit, okay. And I'm just gonna dial back the number of galaxies. If you're not seeing as many galaxy pictures or galaxy symbols as I am, just go into your, just run, do that, run through that again, go into your sky and viewing options window, tab over to where it says DSO, and just, you can slide these up and down to put more or fewer galaxies. And this is ranked by their brightness. So if you wanna see all the really you know, crazy dim ones, crank it up. If you just wanna focus on the easy ones, just dial it down and it's gonna be less confusing. Okay, let me just run this up a little bit. 
All right. So get that, get that star Aldefira in your telescope. And then what you want to do is once you've got that star, is you want to pan your telescope and focus here, go straight down. If you go straight down, I'm just going to measure how far it is for you. It's about three finger widths or three degrees of the sky. Most telescopes um, using your low power eyepiece will show you, depending on the telescope, one and a half or two or so degrees of sky. So it'll actually produce a circle relatively big. So if you head on, let me just turn this off. Take the star head down. Look for this little galaxy right here. And this is called the needle galaxy. Ooh. And it's edge on. And it makes it a little bit easier to see because it's edge on and the stars, the starlight's all concentrated into this narrow streak. So that's one you can cer certainly look for. You can see it's 56 million light years from us. You can see the central spherical bulge, the arms on it, the spiral arms on edge and the dark dust. Now you won't see all of these wonderful details through your small telescope, but you can certainly look for the streak of light and the sort of bright in the middle and then fading out to the two edges. So that's the needle galaxy. And before you get there, if you wanted to do a little detour, mm -hmm. you could go down and look for the koi fish galaxy. And this has got more of a partial oriented, not quite edge on, not quite open, but part way, halfway through. And these other, these little stars that you see here in this, in this picture, these are foreground stars. So they're in our Milky Way but they just happen to be between us and the galaxy beyond, okay? So that's the koi fish galaxy. And then the other thing you can do is start at Aldefira and you're gonna go to the left. So you're gonna go five degrees, which is less than your palms width, less than your palms width held at arm's length. So you're gonna go sort of scan your telescope straight to the left. And when you do that, you're going to look for two galaxies that for two and for two for one. <laughs> so the one above it is called the whale galaxy and it's called the whale galaxy because let me just turn off the symbols here. It actually looks oh. sort of like a whale and a spouting out of his blowhole. And this oh. is actually, there are actually two different galaxies here. So you've got, NGC 4631, the whale, and you've got NGC 4627, this little minor dwarf galaxy right beside him. And together they sort of look like a whale spouting. So that's the whale galaxy. And then in the same field of view of your telescope, and again, it's edge on, so it's fairly bright, should be rel relatively easy to see it. Its visual magnitude is 9.19, is so that's not too bad for dimness. Then you wanna go straight down, and there's your hockey stick right nearby. So you get sort of a two for one, you get the whale and the hockey stick in the same area. Now, I wanna point out one more thing. When you're using a telescope, you've got mirrors and lenses in your telescope that'll flip around the view. And so if you have your Stellarium flip buttons enabled, they're down here. So the view that you're probably going to see in your telescope, it might be just flipped left and right. If your telescope has the diagonal that you look down into, it generally will flip the view left and right. But if you're using one of those white Dobsonian telescopes, um, you know, the big light bucket telescopes that swivel, the Newtonian reflectors, they generally reflect twice. Hmm. So they'll flip the view upside down and left and right. So the, the hockey stick will be above the whale in your eyepiece. Okay. And the same thing as when you're when you're actually scanning, let me go back to Diana, Zephira. So there's that star we started looking at. If you're using your telescope, just put on the symbols again. If you're using your telescope to scan, when you, when you push the front of the tube down in your eyepiece, the stars will go up. So when you're looking through the eyepiece, you'll see the stars going up, it sort of flips around. So it can be a little tricky to, to, to work that out. But, um, but if you use your finder scope in your telescope, you'll want to make sure that it's actually aimed below Aldefira, you know, if you pull back and look at the sky with your eyes rather than above. Now, hey, if you go above, 
you're going to hit another galaxy if a small one. <laughs> but, but they're all over the place. So you can't go too far without hitting a galaxy here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, there's some, there's some uh, relatively pretty easy things to find. Now, you don't have to just look for galaxies. You can look for globular clusters. So this is a globular cluster. If you go back to that, that L-shaped comb Berenices and go down to the bottom star called Diadem, if you put this star in your telescope, chances are you're going to also pick up these globular clusters at the same view. Now, they may not be very bright. Magnitude 7.7, .7, that's brighter than the galaxy. So you might pick that up. Let's just see if I can get a deep sky view of this. Okay, I can see, look for a kind of a um, salt on a black tablecloth effect of a globular cluster. That's how they look. Um, there's a Questions. question about colliding galaxies. Has anyone ever captured an image of two cl galaxies colliding? And the answer to that is many times. And I was wondering if you could maybe show us the Whirlpool galaxy, which is a, a nice... I'm going to show you two things. I'm going to show okay. you the... I'm going to show you the antenna galaxies. The antenna galaxies are in the sky right now. So the antenna galaxies are down here. So just to give you an idea, remember here's Leo, here's Virgo, here's the horizon. So it's pretty low in the sky. But this pair of galaxies, if I've got a photo of them, Ooh. are two galaxies that grabbed each other and are in the process of merging. And these two antennas are streamers of stars that haven't quite figured out where they want to end up yet. And you can see that there's a lot of glowing gas in the center here. And that sort of um, merger has caused the gas in those two galaxies to, um, to start collapsing and um, cascading a great deal of star formation in these two galaxies. So that's the antenna galaxies. And just by the way, let me just see how big these are apart. They're pretty small. So that I'm measuring about the width of the full moon right now. So you can see that they're maybe a quarter of the full moon diameter. They're pretty small in the sky and they're low. So they're going to be tricky to see, but there's that. And then you wanted to go, all right, let's go up to Andromeda. I just, I just yeah, we should do Andromeda too. Yeah. Uh, sorry, and not Andromeda, but uh, the Whirlpool. Yeah, so I like remember what I said about, about Leo, about the, galact the Milky Way's galactic pole is up here in our coma Berenice. So anything in this neighborhood is great for galaxies. And, milk and what a lot of people don't appreciate is that the Big Dipper has loads of galaxies nearby. So let me just come up here and I'm just going to crank up the numbers a little bit. Oops, did I lose it? I'll try that one more time. It's not cooperating. All right. Uh-oh. Might need to start Stellarium again. That's okay. So if you find the Big Dipper, you want to find the bottom star in the Big Dipper's handle. That's Alcade. And you want to zoom in on that. And then I'll just get my measuring tool here. About less than a palm's width to the left here. There's a little smudge, there's a galaxy there. And then the other one is, let me see if I can find him here. Just put on my galaxy pointers here. So this one is the pinwheel galaxy and this one is the whirlpool galaxy. So let me just, and these are both four or five degrees with respect to Alcade. So if you zoom in on the whirlpool galaxy, you're gonna pick up two galaxies that are interacting with each other. So have a main face on spiral galaxy and then a secondary galaxy that's kind of um, been grabbed onto or they formed together, we're not quite sure. And certainly this is something that you can Google and look up a little more information on in your spare time. And if I can pick these up, these are 23 million light years away from our solar system. So that's near the handle of the Big Dipper. That's a very popular beginner astrophotography target. Yeah, um, that Bode's Nebula that I talked about, that's also in this neighborhood, that's up here. So where's Bode's Galaxy? So here's the, here's the bowl of the Big Dipper. And if you start at the 
bottom handle side star and go make a line to the outer rim star and keep going a bit more than their distance and zoom in on that patch of the sky. And again, this is pretty easy to do with your telescope if you're using a wide angle eyepiece. Then you're gonna pick up another two for one. Ooh. Okay, well, three for one actually, but mainly <laughs> you're gonna see this, this um, M81. That was one of those in that gallery of, of five that I showed at the beginning of the talk. So we've got the um, Bodes Nebula here, and this is called the Cigar Galaxy down here. So that's another one you could try for. All right, let's see Perfect. about where we're, we're, it's now 4 four thirty, so I think we should jump quickly to um, Andromeda. And I do have just yeah. to let you know, um, Chris, I have a video ready to go of uh, to answer the many questions about Andromeda and the Milky Way colliding someday. So if you want to first talk about Andromeda as a target, and then I can talk about that briefly. Okay, so let's figure out when Andromeda comes up. So Andromeda should be coming up just to the um, the east of the big square of Pegasus, and it's here. And at this time of the year, you're not getting it until the pre-dawn. So we won't, we'll have to wait till another couple of months before we'll be getting it in the evening sky again, say in maybe in, yeah, by the time we get to June, it starts rising at midnight um, in, in, uh, by the end of, um, end of May. So the Andromeda galaxy is, the closest large galaxy to the Milky Way. It's about two and a half million light years away. And it's actually huge. It actually measures six full moon diameters in the long axis and two full moon diameters in the uh, short axis. And it's got some, when you look at it with your telescope, you have a small backyard telescope, you're probably just going to see the bright fuzzy patch in the middle. Mm. And if you do that, you wanna look and see if you can see these two little supplementary galaxies as well. But again, that's sort of, you can get up in the middle of the night or get up early and try for it now, but um, you know, you just give it a month or two and it'll be avail available in the evening sky again. All right, I'll stop sharing and you can play your video. Okay, yeah, so there has been a lot of, um, uh, there have been quite a few people asking about the possible collision of the Andromeda and the Milky Way, and they are in fact on a collision course, but it's 5 billion years away. So we've got right. lots of time until we collide with them. I'm going to show you guys uh, this video, just this little quick bit here of the two uh, interacting. This one here is Andromeda and there's our Milky Way. And so you'll see why uh, you get those trails of stars going at either side. And now I'm just going to briefly, I'm going to talk, to, talk about this only briefly. The reason that, you know, I'm not super concerned about this is because it's 5 billion years away. That's one thing. Um, yeah. But the, the other thing is that it's not really you know, galaxies are mostly empty space, even though they don't look like they are. There's so much space between the stars. The closest star to us is 4.2 light years away. So that's 42 trillion kilometers. Is that right, Chris? Something like that? Yep. Some massive, massive, massive distance. And so when these two galaxies collide, it's going to be more like um, pouring two bottles of sand together than it would be two cars crashing into each other. Um, and so it's a much, it's very unlikely that stuff will get hit while we collide because there's so much space in, in between all the stars in these galaxies. So yes, yeah. they will collide. Or like blowing uh, two puffs of smoke or steam. You know, That's a good turn. one. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing is that the sort of the smoke and steam is sticky enough that it kind of wants to grab onto the other, the other smoke cloud. Interesting. Okay, cool. That's a good yeah, analogy. So, like and and the end of that, at the end of that process, we may end up with something like the Messier 87 elliptical galaxy or um, giant mm -hmm. elliptical galaxy. It'll be brighter in our sky. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully our heads are in a jar or something and we can still be around or, <laughs> you know, we'll have uh, Off the dream. virtual consciousness that we can hang around, hang out. Um, so we are, we are quickly running out of time, but there are a few questions that I wouldn't mind answering before we run out of time, if that's okay with everyone. Sure. Um, so the first question is, were the Magellanic clouds formed along, along with the Milky Way or were they captured? And then the extension question is, what are the Ma Magellanic clouds? <laughs> So the Magellanic clouds are uh, what we call dwarf galaxies. And yes, they're gravitationally bound to us. Um, I don't know that we know yet whether they were formed um, or captured. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't off the top of my head know that yet, or know if it's known yet, but, um, but it's interesting to, uh, to think about that. Um, 
those those little globular clusters that I that I showed you briefly as well. Um, there are some scientists or astronomers think that those are the cores of former small galaxies that we got that swallowed up. We got that that uh, our Milky Way pulled all their gas and dust out of, and just left those cores. So there's lots to learn about galaxies as we go forward. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and we a reminder to folks that our knowledge now is not necessarily the ultimate truth. Um, it's only the extent of what we know at the moment. For a long time, people thought, you know, that the the galaxy was shaped like a grindstone and it was like a big long square. That was one thing that people thought for a while. Then people thought all these other things as they got more information. And so we are not at the final result of what we know yet. Um, we keep learning more. Uh, and then there was a quick question done um, about if you could just briefly talk about the Lyrids and how to see them because that's happening tomorrow. Oh, cool. I, okay. I will. I will also mention that we're doing a star party tomorrow night, um, and we'll talk more about meteor showers and the Lyrid meteor shower. Uh, that's at ten thirty. If you want to come, um, it'll be. It's on our website. I'll send out the link. But if Chris, you can just briefly mention this, the uh, meteor shower now. That'd be great. So um, meteors are produced by. Um, particles of debris that are dropped by comets. And comets have their orbits around the sun. Uh, periodic comets have stay on a particular orbit around the sun that brings them into the inner solar system every now and again on a regular cycle. And as they get near the sun, they warm up and they start out gassing and dropping debris along their orbits. And that debris accumulates over time. And if the orbit of a particular comet happens to cross Earth's orbit, then every year when the Earth returns to that same spot in the Earth's orbit, we plow through that cloud of particles, maybe size of sand particles or smaller, and our gravity grabs those particles and they fall to the Earth, but they hit the atmosphere of Earth and they burn up, they ionize. They're moving so fast, 100,000 100, kilometers an hour or, the, or more, that they actually um, tunnel ionize the Earth's atmosphere and, and, and sort of drill tunnels to the atmosphere. And those streaks of ionization produce the star, the little trails, the shooting stars that we see. And this is a cool website. This is the meteorshowers.org slash view. And you can plug in any meteor shower you want. And it's actually a 3D model. And if I just zoom in, what you're seeing here is, so the Lyra meteor shower is produced by a comet, the debris dropped by a comet named C1861 G1 Thatcher. So it was discovered in 1861 by an astronomer named Thatcher. He worked out its orbit. And you can see it, I'll just zoom back out. It goes way out away from the inner solar system. And then I think it's every 450 odd years it comes into the inner solar system. And this 3D model is showing Mercury, Venus, and Earth, Earth in blue. And you can see that the dates up here every year around April 22nd or so, Earth's orbit passes close to the comet's orbit. Now, thankfully, the comet's never there when we are, mm -hmm. but, uh, but we certainly plow through its debris. And so depending on the amount of debris that's been dropped and whether that train of debris is a narrow tunnel or if it's a broad cloud, the meteor shower will be of a longer duration or a shorter duration. And the peak of the meteor shower, so the Lyrids will run for a couple of weeks, but the peak is happening at the time when Earth is, is crossing through the densest part of the shower. And that's and, tomorrow, right? Yeah, that's tomorrow. And the, the reason that you want to look up um, in the morning, so it's in the pre-dawn, let me just bring you up into the morning sky here. Now, at the time that we're passing through that cloud of debris, the Earth is actually heading towards the stars of Lyra. So Lyra is over here, where are we going? Here's Vega. So the Earth is actually heading in this direction. And so the meteors are sort of hitting the Earth's atmosphere like, the, like bugs on a windshield when you're driving down the highway. And so, and the hours before dawn, the, um, patch of sky we're sort of drilling into or heading towards is nice and high in the sky. And so we're seeing the meteors all over the sky. If you look earlier in the evening, so this is around four o'clock in the morning when the 
We call that point the radiant of the sky. But if we look earlier in the evening, say the previous evening, so I'll go back to say midnight. Let me see if I can find Lyra right here. Here we go. So first of all, you need to be you need it to be dark so you can see the nice meteors. And you want the, the radiant to be nice and high in the sky, otherwise you're missing the meteors that are hidden by the Earth's bulk. So that's why we like to wait for the radiant to be nice and high in the sky. Don't need a telescope, don't need binoculars. Put your phone away, put your tablet away. Don't want your dark adaptation to be ruined by looking at your phone. And just stare at the sky, find an open sky with, lot, with no lights around you and get a sleeping bag and just spend some time looking up and watching. And you'll see on the peak, maybe 15, 18 in an hour. Perfect, okay, just a heads up, your uh, calendar right now is set on June 22nd. Um, and not April 22nd. Let me go back to April There we 22nd. go. Here Got we a go. couple people noticing. <laughs> yeah, that's why, that's why Lyra is really, uh, Vega is really low in the evening sky. So half the meteors are being hidden by the earth. And then by the time you get to the pre-dawn. Then it's higher. The radiance higher. Thanks for noticing that. No worries. Okay. I think that's all the questions that we really have time for um, today. I'm gonna, this is a perfect example of why we're extending these to 90 minutes because we keep running over by answering questions. Um, so that uh, extension to 90 minutes and just on Tuesdays is gonna be starting next week. So we do have a session this Thursday. Um, we'll be starting next week, just doing it once a week. Um, and I will also send out the link for our landing page on our website so that if uh, any, you do have to register for the sessions that we've just added, which will be everything after this Thursday. So make sure that you go back and you register um, for the next sessions. The topics that we're covering are going to be Messier and NGC objects. We're going to talk about apps and tools. Uh, we're also going to talk about double stars and beginner telescopes. And then later on into May, we're going to have some astro some more astrophotography sessions. Um, so please keep on joining us. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you again, Chris, for doing all this. Um, My pleasure. And we'll see you all on Thursday for a deeper dive into Messier and NGC and all these all these little different. What does all that mean anyway? What does all that mean? And who even was Messier? That's right. So let <laughs> us right. know if you see any of the galaxies. Yes, please do. Let us know if you can find any of those out there. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you what you can see up in the sky. All right, everybody. See you later. Thanks for joining. We'll see you guys next. Uh, we'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a good day.